Good morning, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome to day two of the Low Carb Lifestyle Long Weekend. We have another awesome uh, session lined up for you this morning and I really, really hope that you enjoy it and engage and ask the questions to the presenters while they're here. Um, before I introduce you to Sarah, Dr. Sarah Hancock, I want to just say please share, take, take photos of the screen and share on social media and tell everyone what you know you're learning and how awesome it is for you welcome to tag the hub and we will share for you as well um, but you know just help us get the message out there I guess there's just so much more awesome information in this summit um, and I'm so thrilled to be bringing it to you so well let's get going so there's a few people I know that will probably you'll pop in during the day in and out please feel free to do that everything's recorded but make your make the most of the opportunity to have access to these incredible practitioners. So, our um, our first practitioner is Dr. Sarah Hancock, and she is in New Zealand, and she's going to talk today about barriers to family health. We were just having a chat together before we came on live um, about the importance of this. I think, you know, we can get all the knowledge that we want. But if we don't know how to address the, the barriers to make this work for ourselves and our family, it will just always be really challenging. And I think, as Sarah and I were saying, you know, the world is as it is. It's not going to wake up one morning and suddenly embrace wellness in terms of the way that we want it to. And sugar isn't going anywhere and processed foods aren't going anywhere. So I think, you know, really learning from people like Sarah how to overcome the barriers is a really, really important part of embracing the lifestyle for you. So um, let me tell you a little bit about Sarah. She has a PhD and she's designed novel strategies to compare the health and nutrition knowledge of children, parents and health professionals for oral and general health. So what many people don't realise is our oral health is very much linked to our metabolic health. A range of barriers are experienced by children and adults for healthy eating. These include ultra-processed food products, and more, of course. So strategies that address the public health challenge of chronic disease through the life course should encompass evidence regarding dietary factors, knowledge, barriers to eating well, and consideration of the food environments within communities. Dr. Hancock is an advocate for dietary lifestyle, dietary lifestyles incorporating a whole food eating pattern that minimizes the intake of highly refined ultra-processed foods, for the prevention of chronic diet related diseases. She's currently training to be a health coach and nutritionist at the Holistic Performance Institute. So I will bring her in. Good morning. Good morning, Tracy. How are you today? <laughs> I'm awesome. So I'm going to put your um, presentation up and I'll pop out, Sarah, and I will see you at the end for some from conversation and questions. Have thank fun. you, Tracy. And bye. And thank you, Tracy, for that lovely introduction. So my presentation this morning is going to be, as Tracy mentioned, the barriers to family health, as I've explored that through my PhD research. And there's just some pictures here on the screen, um, most of which will pop up during the presentation um, as far as um, principally the problems around ultra-processed food and the impacts that has at multiple levels within the society in which we live in. So outline of my discussion, we're going to, I'm going to discuss ultra-processed food and dental caries, um, what we know about healthy eating, and the knowledge I've investigated is that of children aged between 10 and 12 years old, their parents, but also the health professionals who design and instigate healthy eating interventions or provide dietary advice as part of their clinical practice. Well, I'm also going to outline how I've explored the challenges and barriers for families as far as healthy eating according to what they understand is healthy eating. We're also going to discuss some potential solutions and I think that's what we'll get into hopefully in the Q&A later on is that okay well what do we do about this and how do we address these problems and challenges that we have. So just moving on now. So what we've known for many many years is that diet and oral health are intricately linked and 
In the, um, but through most of human history, food shortages have been the principal priority to address um, up until the last 100 years, and particularly in the last 50 years when we've had a proliferation of foods designed. Um, but what we discovered in the 1920s during what was known as the vitamin deficiency era, because vitamin deficiencies were a principal reason for malnutrition and disorders associated with malnutrition, is that vitamin D was really important as far as bone and or bone health, oral health, and um, general health, because we know that vitamin D helps with supplying bones and teeth with calcium for and also is really important for optimal tooth development even before we're born. I've included some references here from Beckett and Schroth, um, respectively, and where they found that vitamin D, um, or mothers who were had vitamin D deficiency while they were pregnant with their children, those children actually had some problems with um, enamel development, but also they had a greater um, carries burden. And we know that dairy produce is also beneficial because it um, enables the delivery of those fat-soluble vitamins for bone and tooth development. But we also know that vitamin D aids or helps changes in the amount of the biochemical composition of saliva by which our teeth are cleaned um, naturally. So we're very lucky in that way. But it also controls hormones, cell growth, aids neurological function, and it's also got a number of immunological benefits, many of which have been studied now, at particularly in the last two to three years, um, since COVID became um, a major factor in our lives. Um, we also know that the um, temporal patterns of availability of refined carbohydrates also had an impact on caries burdens or tooth decay burdens. So in World War II, when there were shortages of sugar, there were um, decreases in diabetes-related mortality among British women by about 29%. But also coinciding with that period of time is that while awful things were happening to um, British people um, because of the rationing, um, there was a 28% decrease in new caries um, over that time. More recently, in Iraq, as you're all well known as we've all lived through this or lived through knowing about this is that there were a range of sanctions imposed um, which resulted in a decrease in the per person intake of sugar yearly from 50 kilos per person per year to 12 kilos per person per year and there were decreases in dental caries in those children over that time which is really interesting that moving right along um, through last century as a range of um, speakers and um, on Tracy's Low Carb Lifestyle Weekend. Um, most notably, Belinda Fecky, who's exa examined this in huge detail, is that there were increased burdens of non-communicable disease um, that you know, gave rise to new um, courses of investigation. And one of the most famous of these were Ansel Key's Seven Countries Study, where they, um, which established a dominant and ongoing belief that dietary fat was the um, principal cost factor for cardiovascular disease. And so with a range of changes with the establishment of dietary guidelines in the United States in 1980, after which other countries followed suit. Alongside all of that, we've had a range of technological changes in the field of agriculture in which we've had food-like substances produced. And that's occurred with the cooperation of governments in the subsidization of um, the manufacture of staple crops. So what we have is processing of starches and grains to um, make breads and other refined um, carbohydrate-based foods using a range of methods like autoclaving, drum drying. And but what we do know, then this is quite interesting, is the more um, greater or the more aggressive the mechanical agitation by which these wheat products are processed at, and the greater of the heating, actually has an effect in the mouth and that it keeps the sugars, not just um, sweet foods, but the sugars in your starches on your teeth for longer, and they're actually associated with reduced clearance times from the mouth. So it has quite an impact as far as the, um, because what we do know is that with saliva essentially cleans your teeth in between um, eating meals, 
and in that the high and frequent intake of carb-based or refined carb-based foods is actually associated with greater caries burdens. What we have now, though, is a whole range of ultra-processed foods, and they, these are characterised by the packaged very attractively in a way that encourages multiple consumption episodes or highly frequent intakes. Um, there's um, the there's a lot of emulsifiers, fats, um, additives, preservatives, um, a whole lot of things you can't um, read easily, or well, there are more than five ingredients and many of which you can't pronounce. And But they're also um, a pro huge proportion of our dietary intakes. So as a consequence of the dietary guidelines and the advice of this and the increased, in, you know, the encouragement to increase our intakes of refined foods. The benefits of these vitamin D rich foods and dairy produce, particularly full fat dairy and the prevention of poor oral health, has been sidelined over time. And so what this has led to is that we've got an increased focus in preventive dentistry on non-dietary approaches. So that's whether we um, have, you know, there's an encouragement to have um, community water fluoridation and for the water supply to be fluoridated, but also much of oral hygiene health promotion is around the use of toothpaste, dental flossing, and that's been well and truly co-opted by the sugar industry, which took the line that, well, actually, you can eat anything you want as long as you clean your teeth, you'll be fine. But even though we've, in reviews of fluoride or fluoridated toothpaste and other oral hygiene practices, including the flossing of teeth, as a solution to um, for the prevention of caries, um, they're of fairly mixed quality and there's relatively little evidence of benefit, particularly as the studies were not particularly well conducted. And that was um, shown in a systematic, by, systematic review by Philippe Hujol, who's a um, public health dentist in, at the University of Washington. And what we have now is very few trials of interventions, including whole food, reduced carbohydrate diets and dental caries. Much of the, many of the trials, for instance, are looking at things like improving oral health knowledge through, the, um, through instruction to brush your teeth twice a day, um, use fluoridated toothpaste, as opposed to just, okay, what happens if we change the, um, change the dietary intake but it's very that's been not tested particularly well, apart from in some small small studies that have taken place in Central Europe in the last few years. So we've got a oral health um, health promotion focus around um, toothpaste, fluoridated water, the provision of toothbrushes, as opposed to a focus on diet related prevention. Unfortunately, with all of this, we have, um, you know, the, the promotion of whole grains, that's been co-opted by the food industry. And you'll see here that this is probably the worst example that I've probably ever seen. But Nestle have now produced something called this thing called Kit Kat cereal, which is marketed as being nutritious because it's made with whole grains and that they're a source of vitamins and minerals, but they're not a particularly bioavailable source of vitamins and minerals, as you'd all well know. They've been added in, and they state here in this advertisement that it's a source of B vitamins and two minerals. Um, apparently, they're iron and folate, but um, there's all sorts of things in here, in which I think we could all agree are probably not best suited for consumption well at all, and, and certainly not for consumption in the morning, and certainly not for consumption by children who are heading off to school for the day. It's just going to make them hungrier for even more of these foods, given that these very much are ultra-processed products. And that's an example of something that's bright, and it's a breakfast cereal company. But we've also got food industry, and this is from a local producer in New Zealand, actually, and that they produce this smoothie mix. And you'll see that there's no garish, horrible colours, but it's, um, you know, there's been a bit of health washing here. They've got lovely pictures of fruit and berries in the package, it's all very lovely. But if we have a look at the content of this, it's a blend of fruit and vegetables, but there's also um, grains and honey. And that's not going to be any good for anybody's teeth, young or old. 
And when you open up this stuff, because I was given a packet of it when I did a Spirited Women's Adventure event, it actually smells like potato chips and doesn't look anything like the, these products that it's um, marketed around. There's no, it's just a coloured powder. But what we know is that with all these ultra processed foods, the high and frequent consumption of these are associated with, and many of the speakers at the Low Carb Lifestyle Hub will be going into some details around um, hyperinsulinemia, insulin resistance, metabolic syndrome, which are the underpinning um, tenets um, leading to type 2 diabetes, and the associated disorders, including cancer. Um, presentation is overweight or obese, neurological conditions, but there's also inflammatory conditions within the microbiota, both within the mouth and through the gastrointestinal system. There's vitamin deficiencies because when we're eating a lot of these processed foods, we're probably omitting other um, nutrient-rich and vitamin and mineral-rich sources of natural foods, but also it leads to poor oral health. So just looking at the associations between ultra-processed foods and dental caries, as part of my PhD, I conducted a systematic review looking at the um, caries burdens associated with foods and specifically focused on um, both sweet foods, like the usual culprits that we regard and or that we hold responsible for dental caries, such as sugary drinks, but also your know, foods are not regarded as necessarily sweet. While there are mixed findings on the total exposures of carbohydrate-based foods, because we also consume them at meal times with other caries protective foods such as meat and full-fat dairy, um, between meals snacking was associated with a high frequency of consumption of ultra-processed foods, just in the same way that between meal consumption of sugary drinks and cakes and biscuits is also associated with caries. But we also found that there were protective effects of other foods um, such as full fat dairy produce and meat. So I'm just going to veer right into another element of my research in which it was formative research. So we got uh, had a card sorting exercise. And so there are some statements of behaviors that were, um, you know, that are often cited as important for dental caries protection. And so we did this for children who were aged between 10 and 12 because they've had a certain amount of health promotion education. Um, and that's the, the, likely the oldest that they'll be before they start earning their own pocket money and having their own disposable income and therefore making some purchasing decisions of their own regarding um, food consumption. Also surveyed their parents and a range of health professionals, including general practitioners, nurses from iwi providers in New Zealand and general practices, and also some dentists. And what we found is that health professionals, the bars are in the green, the parents in the bars are in the blue, and the children, the bars are in the yellow. And they all regarded, nearly all of them regarded oral hygiene strategies as really important for the prevention of poor oral health. And this included a couple of low-carb prescribing doctors as well, which was really interesting that um, they thought this way regarding um, oral hygiene as well too. So we've got flossing teeth, which regarded as really important, brushing teeth, visiting the dentist for checkups, and visiting a hygienist for cleaning was deemed as really quite important by um, the adults, um, less so by the children as well too. The importance of dietary behaviours is where this gets really rather interesting because, and also um, one of the more interesting facets of this is that the dietary behaviours and the importance of those are in line with the um, advice provided in dietary guidelines, which underpins all the um, dietary health promotion information. So I've got here drinking more plain water. Eating less sugar was regarded as um, important, but eating vegetables and fr fruit, fruit less important, but still regarded as important by the children who have also been told to have five, five plus a day of fruit and vegetables. But fortunately, the health professionals and the parents um, recognise that fruit might have been causative of, or associated with some problems. But essentially, eating less sugar, drinking water and eating vegetables is really important. Let's have a look here. Eating carbohydrates. The kids thought that was relatively um, important. Fortunately, the parents and health professionals didn't. But if we look at 
eating fat and eating meat. I put the circles above the slide um, just to draw the attention to them without actually excluding the um, getting in the way. But very few people, including the health professionals and the parents, thought that eating fat was important. More parents felt that eating the meat was important. The majority of the parents who thought this was important were, were farmers or came from a farming background. Um, but the children didn't regard eating meat as particularly important for their oral health. So it's interesting that the um, advice lines up with, or what they know lines up with dietary guideline recommendations, including foods for which there are caveats around the consumption and dietary guidelines, such as eating um, reduced fat dairy, if you're going to consume dairy at all, and eating lean meat, if you were to, re to consume meat at all. So I then went and gave everyone these cards for them to sort into piles of whether these are good or bad for your oral health. So you'll see there, there's about only about 25 cards and they're deliberately kept fairly simple um, because they were in previous research, we know that if you were to give children more than 25 cards, they might lose interest in the whole task and not um, complete it. But it also enabled the comparison between children, adults and health professionals, because normally if in a survey, you can't compare survey results between those groups. So we decided to do the simple card sorting exercise. And in the study, which we published last year, um, we found that red meat was deemed as not particularly important for oral health by children in the blue bars, but also fewer adults thought that it was important. But if we have a look at the breakfast cereals, a number of children thought that this was important for the reduction of dental caries. Very few adults did, which was good. But when I asked all these kids what they'd had for breakfast, they all said breakfast cereals, which have been purchased by their parents anyway, which is um, interesting. But you can sort of see where all the advice kind of lined up, but the red meat um, element is quite important. So, I've, so that's how we look at in prevention in New Zealand. The guidelines, do they reflect the evidence around dietary risk factors? Well, you know, we're told to restrict the sugar intake, but it all gets a bit confusing when we're told to consume a diet that aligns with dietary guideline recommendations. Moving on, though, we examined the barriers for children, their parents and health professionals in prescribing dietary advice. And so for the child, their ideas around healthy eating were involved the consequences of what happened if you ate too much sugar, you'd be sick. There were rules that the parents imposed, like we're not eating afternoon tea after four o'clock. It was education at school, but also for some younger children, their preferences became quite important. The barriers that they discussed though, were social factors like eating with other people. Um, one child said their dad worked for a um, soft drink delivery company and he would quite frequently bring home um, boxes of soft drink like Coca-Cola, but also the food environment is quite important. And at school, there's one young lad sort of said, well, you know, we have all these fundraisers and while their parents don't allow, might not allow soft drink in the house, they often see their parents selling soft drink at school fundraisers and which isn't helpful. So that's the children and some of the barriers that they cite. And it's actually really interesting that they, um, one child said, well, it's not like it's as bad for you as drugs and or cigarettes and alcohol because they wouldn't sell that at a school fundraiser, but it can't be that bad for you because it's being sold at school. But these things are being let into the school environment by um, figures of authority or figures that they see as of figures of authority, such as teachers. We look at parents and caregivers, their, here are their ideas around healthy eating, includes, involves gender roles, traditions, culture, enjoyment of their food, family support, like what they've been brought up eating, but also what family members are providing for them, such as grandparents who might bring around meals or indeed feed the children. But there's also, they have sets of rules that they apply to their own eating. There's um, access to food, um, has an impact on what they believe, but their knowledge. But they've also got some barriers for their healthy eating. So what, while they know quite a lot and their ideas about food are in line with healthy eating advice, there's a range of barriers that um, exist that impact on their choices. And so there are logistics, behaviour, psychological factors, social factors, but also elements pertaining to the food environment. 
And here's how this sort of works, the logistics of things like their knowledge about healthy food, their own cooking skills, the time they have available to do this, which is impacted on by jobs, um, be how organised they are, but also geography, and this relates to their access to food. And in rural environments where, you know, there might not be many people with driver's licences, for instance, at the bottom of Lake Taupo, um, that has an impact on the access to foods and such as if they're doing shift work late at night, like cleaning schools or stocking supermarket shelves, it's a little bit difficult for them to get up early to go to a weekend market. Cost of food ingredients is also a major factor that impose, it impinges on your logistics, but also on the food environment, which is chock full, as we know, of ultra-processed foods. It's around 70% of what's in New Zealand supermarkets, and it's probably similar in Australia. It's Im impacted on by the advertising of foods, but also some confusion about what's good and what's not, which is influenced by mass media, um, scientific publications, and mainstream media reporting of those findings. We've got behavioural habits, and that's a huge element as well too, whether we're in the habit of um, cooking for ourselves, um, snacking, and which are also um, influenced by emotional eating, by how we are at alcohol intake, but also food addiction and any other any of those behaviours. There's also psychological factors, including willpower, if you're eating by yourself, if you're depressed or if you're tired, all those factors drive um, decisions or impinge on decisions made around your healthy eating. But we've also got these social factors. There's other family members. Um, you might want to, um, you know, for instance, I'll give you an example. There's a lot of children who are taken care of by grandparents and other fam family figures after school. And if they're providing treat foods to the grandchildren that they might not have provided to their own children when they were growing up, that has an impact on the barriers that um, a a families um, and children experience for healthy eating. Um, if you're eating by yourself, with the loneliness as well too, that can um, that can be a factor. There's also family health issues. So if someone has a chronic disease in your family, like for instance, I grew up in a family where my sister has type, was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. That had an impact on all of our food choices as well too. But there's also social pressure. And what happens there is that you, know, you might be out somebody somewhere like watching your children playing sport and there'll be, um, there's only one supply of food there and it tends to be ultra processed junk that's shelf stable and so the kids might go and um, you know you could take a soup to a sports event or something really healthy but once one person one of your children's friends comes along with hot chips and says I've brought these to share well um, your child never mind how much they might like that soup at home is probably going to head straight for those hot chips. So for our health professionals, and this is important to consider that we've got the child here, we've got the parent, they experience some of these own barriers, these same barriers as the parents do for their own eating, particularly as many of these health professionals were parents themselves. Their, um, what they regard as healthy eating is also impacted on by their knowledge. Um, and interestingly, they discuss the fact that they get very little nutrition education at university during their time at medical school, but their patients expect them to be fonts of knowledge regarding nutrition, particularly when much of what they will see in the course of daily practice um, relates to diet-related disease. But the health professionals themselves, many of them felt that they lacked knowledge in nutrition, which is a really interesting finding. But they've also... Um, accumulated a lot of experience in dealing with patients, but some of their barriers to providing dietary advice are the logistics. They have very little time during a consultation to provide advice. They have their own psychological factors that might mean their own health issues, um, loneliness, all the same psychological factors that um, everyone else gets to experience. They're not immune to that, but also other social factors as well too, such as their own, um, their colleagues, um, have an impact on whether on the degree to which they can provide dietary advice, particularly if you are a sole low carb practitioner in a medical practice and no one else is supportive of this, but they might want to um, maintain a dietary guideline based approach to healthy eating, even though they might agree that some of that advice is flawed. 
And there's also other social factors with regard to um, potential censure by um, other health professionals, which there's a um, history of, as anyone who's ever um, read or listened to the story stories of Jennifer Elliott, who is an Australian dietitian, but also Dr. Gary Fecky, um, where the, there's been significant opposition um, by the colleagues to um, providing low carbohydrate based advice. So this is a rather complicated diagram, but we've um, covered parts of this. And this is what's called a socio-ecological of healthy eating, which I've constructed from this. So here we've got the child with their consequences, rules, education, preferences, the parents with the factors that impinge on their own knowledge, but also these are the factors that they share with health professionals as far as their, the basis of their knowledge about healthy eating. We've got the barriers for their eating, the barriers for providing dietary advice, but this is all influenced also by community level influences that were cited by all respondents respondents and all the people or the kids in the focus groups and the parents and health professionals in their semi-structured interviews that they discussed the school food environment where a child could go to school five days a week and they've been given sweet food on each of those days even though the parents are trying to um, keep their home home food environments um, clean or um, relatively free from junk foods we've got food at public sports facilities got fast food outlets and the marketing of food, which is all influenced by these national level influences, but the healthcare system, which is fragmented where medicine's here, nutrition is here, dentistry is well over here, and they don't tend to meet. But we've got government policy, we've got industry, agriculture, um, pharmaceutical and the food industries, um, government policy interest groups, particularly those that are promoting um, and reduced intake of red meat for environmental reasons. We've got regulatory bodies, we've got academia, and we've got mass media as well too. So how this plays out in the real world is that there's a slide here of three girls, one of whom is my daughter. She's the um, last with the red hair and the yellow shirt. This was taken several years ago when they competed at an event called the Tough Guy, Tough Girl Challenge. It was kind of like a cross country type event with crawling under nets and up and over fences and, you know, an obstacle course. And it was very muddy. Um, it was held in Rotorua, which um, is known for its um, volcanic um, activity. Uh, but they had a lovely time. But on finishing, they were given, you'll see in their hands, that they were given bottles of Powerade. Now, they didn't need this Powerade. They were running for less than half an hour they weren't that thirsty but that's what they were given at the end of an event um, that's you know celebrating physical activity and so we've got these problems happening with the conflation of physical activity healthy endeavor but with all these foods so the ideas that we probably need to consider is that we need to work on the dietary guideline recommendations for oral health as well as those for general health given that oral health and general health are intricately linked. We also um, need to change how we probably educate health professionals with motivational interviewing, but also coaching. And this is where it's really, really important. Um, and it's really important work that Tracy does in this realm as far as actually recognizing that just telling people what to do hasn't worked. Um, it's gonna continue not working. And we need to focus on the prevention early in the life course and possibly before children are born, but while people are not, um, you know, when, when they're generally healthy, but focus prevention of poor oral health in children, but also poor metabolic health um, early when people are about to come par become parents and rather than wait until um, people are returning abnormal blood glucose tests. But we need to, and this is where coaching is important, is to design some preventive strategies to incorporate the addressing of the barriers, such as the health coaching, and such as understanding the barriers that the people in front of you are, do experience towards healthy eating, rather than just telling people what to do. And we need to change elements of this fragmented healthcare system, because while we have um, oral health promotion educators providing um, advice and care, a lot of the problems with the dental system with, for children with dental caries is taking care of the hospital system. And in New Zealand on a daily basis, during each weekday, we spend $132,000 per day on the extraction of multiple teeth of 
preschoolers under general anaesthetic. So the implications um, and the main take home messages, the poor quality diet has some really huge effects on your oral health, but also in chronic non-communicable disease of dietary origin. Um, for preventing caries, we probably need to intervene early in the life course and involve integrated collaborative approaches between health professions, but also health coaching. And that leads to the next point is that coaching is really rather important and that actually real change does require addressing barriers at multiple societal levels. And that's just that moves beyond the coaching, but also looking at how we can be advocates for health in our own communities, because the change isn't coming from the top down. We've tried that. Um, they say science advances one funeral at a time, but maybe we just need to engage in grassroots education and advocacy at community community levels to address these barriers that exist at multiple levels. And that's the end of my presentation. Yay. Thank you, Sarah. That was amazing. Um, are you still there? I'm still very oh, much here. Yeah, good. <laughs> I thought I might have lost you for a second. Um, so much. I, I mean, I love the work you do. And I've heard you talk about your PhD before, but I, I I learn something every time you speak about it and it still astounds me that the sugar industry played such a role in the whole dental, you know, stuff. Yeah. It, you know, when you, you said, um, you know, eat what you want and clean your teeth, I just think that is such a corporate strategy. It's what Coke and McDonald's and all that do as well. Just yeah. run it off. Eat our stuff. Yeah. Don't stop everything in moderation, but just go run it off. It's the same strategy. And it's really interesting, and I'll send you a paper that um, Philippe Hujol wrote, and he was discussing how fluoride actually, or the people who are really into the instigation of community water fluoridation in the United States way back when, oh, yeah. it was very much influenced by the sugar industry as well too, and that they were right behind this too. Yeah, and you know, and it was really controversial when fluoride was first imposed because there's only, you know, there's a there's sort of a beneficial level, but the gap between benefit and harm is actually really quite small. And like a number of these things, they never actually examined any safety data before this became adopted as a strategy. Yeah, so it's and like this dogma it. now that now it's too hard to change. It's just accepted. Yeah. People accept it as, yeah. you know, and, and I, think, I mean... Yeah, and I think with fluoridation, while we kind of probably almost need it because of the sugar-soaked environment that we live in, um, as a protective, um, you know, through history, you know, people experience really good dental health without community water fluoridation and without you know. luminous dentists, you know, um, being yeah. installed in towns. So, yeah, it's really interesting reading. And I'll, I'll just make a note to send those articles. Thank you. To no, send them through. And I'm happy to share them with anyone who's interested in reading them as well. But, um, I mean, I was just, I don't eat fluoride. Uh, I eat fluoride. I don't have it because I have Hashimoto's and the fluoride affects the thyroid. It's, it's very interesting. I mean, there's so much out there too about the, the problems with fluoride and we could remove both problems by hmm, removing processed food, but we know that's not going to happen. So, you yeah. know, what you've, your talk has really just highlighted the, the many barriers, sorry. Yeah. <coughs> You know, from the individual to the family to the professional. I loved how you talk, talked about it from the health professional's perspective as well because I think sometimes we're quite, often quite hard on them to just, you know, come on, just, you you know, you should know this stuff. But they they themselves have so many barriers, as you said. They don't get educated on it. It has to be on their own bat to really find it. But then there's that professional you know, discomfort of, you know, maybe getting into trouble or going against the grain and all that stuff. That's massive. Mm. Yeah, it's actually, I was humbled by how much they opened up about their lack of confidence and prescribing dietary advice. But that the majority of them were parents like everyone else. And, mm. that was, and they face all the same barriers with feeding their families. You know, whether it's fussy eaters, picking them up after school, everyone's cold, tired, everything else. Yeah. And so that was quite interesting. But there's that real disconnect with what everyone expects them to know and what they actually do know. But they said, you know, their medical education has actually ill-equipped them for dealing with these problems. 
and they and then they discussed the relationship with their patients as well too where they were talking about well actually you know I know that I sound like a bossy boots and I know that I come from a place of privilege and this is what the, most of the doctors um, apart from a couple who actually weren't involved in raising small children at all which was really interesting but most of the doctors go I know what I'm saying I'm not trying to shame anybody but people take it as a punitive type of instruction or they feel like they're being told off by their doctor. Mm. Um, and I brought this up at a community health thing and people say, but yeah, but we'll, this is what how we're taught to, um, you know, this is what we do. We just tell people what to do and expect people to do it. And they know that yeah. that's not sufficient. Um, but with the time constraints in a 15 minute GP consultation. That's right. It's very yeah. hard. Yeah, many pretty, barriers. Yeah, yeah, there's, mm. there's so many barriers, but it's the fact that some of the health professionals saw themselves as, I'm not meaning to sound like I'm telling anybody off, I'm trying to help, and that's why they got into medicine in the first place. Yeah, but, but in that short time frame, it's kind of like, just do this, do this, take this, do this, and off you go. Yeah. You know, that's kind of all they've got time for. Yeah, and then I think, like, the other professionals who were not doctors, they accepted, yeah, well, food's expensive. And the doctors, most of them apart from a couple, who they actually said, yeah, I can appreciate how the cost of food, well, it's not an issue for them because they're on big salaries, but they appreciated that the cost of food was going to be a significant issue for the people mm. that they're treating. And they know that they come across as wealthy white warriors and all the rest of it who can sort of sit there and, you know, sit there in a practice room yeah. and sort of tell people what to do. And people, are, but that doesn't equip people when they step out that consult or that medical surgery and yeah. sort of go and make these decisions at rush hour. They've forgotten to get the meat out. If there's cold, tired, hungry kids that go to the supermarket. Yeah, all these junk food is at the kids' eye level. And yeah. but a pest of power and suddenly you find yourself buying a heat and eat pizza. Yeah, I know, I know. That's that that's such a reality for most yeah. families, you know. And I think it is interesting that it's one of the things I've, I wrote down, you know, the it so annoys me. I mean, and fine, it annoys me. But the, the fact that the food that we need for our health is so expensive, you know, like, and it's just yeah. gotten worse over the last, I mean, COVID, mm. all that stuff skyrocket. Oh, um, we, and now processed food's so cheap. Yeah, and it's even more cheap, and especially when we had all these floods around the North Island mm. and you know, Cyclone Gabriel, you know, we had two cyclones and flooding episodes that was significant. Um, but it's the wiping out of so many crops in the Hawke's Bay region meant that there were some actual shortages that sort of, you know, th these things were just in very, really short supply at supermarkets throughout the North Island. And it bumped up the cost there. And a friend of mine went to the South Island during the same period and said, well, everything was so much cheaper down there because they still had access to the fruit and vegetables down there that weren't damaged. You know, the storms didn't damage anything there. But the Hawke's Bay at the moment is a complete mess. Um, most of the pictures that get thrown up are of vineyards, um, you know, with ruined crops. Um, but also, you know, that's had an impact on, the, you know, everything else that gets produced from what is regarded as the fruit and vegetable bowl of New Zealand. Um, because, you know, there's a the climate, but, you know, you get all these significant weather events, which your livestock are just not as vulnerable to, um, although, you know, there were plenty of dead cows and sheep around the place there. But, you know, you sort of think all these climate events <clears throat> have an impact on crop failure or, you know, how well your crops do over summer. And this isn't going to go away as a problem. No. No, yeah. but ruminants generally pretty resilient, aren't they? You know, you can have... and you know, there's that that's another talk in and of itself about how important ruminant animals are around the world, as mm. far as you know, whether you're in Africa, you know, for the upcycling of protein and the fact that it's a nutrient and highly bioavailable source of vitamins and minerals here. Yeah, Did you yeah. Have any questions? we've got. Yes, no, we do. And um, just I wanted to talk about the vitamin D. So one yeah. of the things, you know, you talked about vitamin D as um, the, you know, what we're eating now is basically foods that are lacking in vitamin D. And one of the things they've stopped doing here is um, doctors have stopped actually checking people's vitamin D in their blood tests now because they've just, everyone's as low. So they don't even check it as a, a test anymore. And I'm just kind of, it's kind of like, well, 
isn't that kind of that proverbial putting it under the just sweep it under the carpet like well it's kind of the acceptance that oh well you're vitamin d deficient and just accepting that without actually sort of going well actually this is going to have some impacts a your immune system Mm -hmm. but b if ability to be adequately nourished and this is where you sort of think maybe that needs to be checked first and foremost maybe in pregnant women given that there are these links between poor tooth enamel formation Mm. and vitamin d deficiency and so once you have this malnourished tooth it's so much more vulnerable to an acid attack and especially with you know the frequent intake of ultra processed foods um you know there's there's some knock-on effects of these deficiencies Mm -hmm. but also as far as the calcium absorption but we also know that you know vitamin d supplementation um without vitamin k2 supplementation well that can lead to some poor outcomes as well if you just supplement with calcium vitamin d because you need vitamin k2 Mm. to actually it's essentially an activator of vitamin d to actually ensure that the calcium goes where you want it to yeah. Um, but also, it, it's an activator of NGLA protein, which works to keep the calcium out of your blood vessels and stop, you know, your plaques along there becoming calcified, which is, you know, has an, an effect on your cardiovascular disease risk as well, mm. too, which mm. is just really important. Yeah. Mm, mm, very important. Very important. So there's a comment made about, um, so I haven't really got many questions, lots of comments. So the grandparent factor. So in, what, what's your, what when you talked about the barriers, you know, and what you talked about the grandparents, you know, who may have fed their own children, you know, real food, but now, you know, show up to the door with crap for their, the grandkids because it's their role as a grandparent to spoil their grandkids. And that's, any, any insights? <laughs> yeah. And well, while these things don't, these things are not treats anymore, you know, we, we're all human beings and we all like to sort of, Um, you know provide treats but there's a lot of grandparents in New Zealand who are engaged in the daily care of children um, particularly in Maori families Um, and also where what the grandmother might say has a huge impact on what the children will do and I had a health visitor or a um, community um, nurse who would say look you're doing some you might be doing some really good work with a young mother and then their mother comes along and says, all right, that baby is crying because he's hungry and he needs crushed wheat bix in his milk, so give them to me and I'll sort them out. Mm. And this daughter will just go, okay, better do that then. And so there's all this good work being undone by a very matriarchal grandparental figure. But also the sort of provision of treats on a daily basis is something that somebody did recognise that actually, you know, that's not what, you know, the kids that's adding to an already high sugar load that the kids are having. Um, But it's quite difficult to tell their own mothers to not give their kids sugar or that they don't like what they're giving them. They don't want to offend them, particularly when grandparents are engaged in the care of, or you know, trying to help out a family and they appreciate that help. But um, it's coming with other um, complications as well too. So did you have to deal with that with your um, in-laws or your parents or anything with your kids? Um, Not really. I mean, we live in the same town as my husband's parents and probably because at that point when they were smaller, I was doing the after-school care. So my in-laws weren't engaged with that as much. You know, they'd occasionally go around to the grandparents' place, but it was only occasionally, but mainly because... My work at the time was such that I was myself or my husband because he starts work at six in the morning. He's a physiotherapist and um, he starts work at six so he can finish by three and so he can do the after school pickups while I continued working, whether it was at work or on my PhD in the last few years. So Mm. that um, sort of worked quite well, but I could see how this was happening in other other families here. Yeah, I think it's a big. I think it's a big problem. I mean, I had to address it in my family with my, with my mm. in-laws and my parents. And you know, in terms of, oh, I mean, this is obviously years ago now, but it's it's just seeing getting them to, I guess, unravel the whole um, love factor. You know, yeah. that if it's, it, you know, it's almost like we know the damage it does. It, we start our kids on it so young. 
Um, you know, we would never, you'd never bring around cigarettes and alcohol as a love factor for your, you know, but it's almost the same thing. And, you know, but show it, we, how can we show it in other ways? Let's do things together. I talk about mm. that a lot. You know, we got to take the food away. I mean, food's yeah. always going to be a part of our culture and part of families, but it's much more about the focus being, or being with each other and talking and yeah. doing things together rather than what, you know, the sugar that you bring. Yeah, because often, you know, if you're doing something, you know, you might be playing a board game or something, but if you're just mindlessly eating, you know, it's um, it's just something you're doing, but it's not, you don't need it, mm. you know, you can, um, you know, there's other things you can do, but, you know, there's this idea that kids need, and it's actually in the New Zealand Dietary Guidelines for um, for children, is that children need multiple snacks per day, and so if you go and look up, a dietary advice or advice on healthy eating that's endorsed by the government that's exactly what it says and mm. that's one of the problems with the dental advice because we know that the frequent eating is such a problem um you know especially with it's the between meal eating so essentially if you can have meals which you're aiming for satiety um with a certain protein load at each meal um, to try and cut down that need for mid-morning snacking. But, you know, if you have a breakfast with wheat bix or toast or whatever, all that's going to do is make you hungry in the morning. That's right. Whereas that's right. as opposed to having something that's going to be a driver of satiety. Um, yeah, that was um, mentioned quite a bit last night. It was interesting with um, Annika. She talked about, um, you know, with, with her topic with sugar in the family. So she talked about how, you know, the first step that she recommends is adding protein and fat to the meals. Start adding in before, and then you can slowly take away, depending on the age of the kids, of course, but, you know, just increase those satiety um, foods, yeah. get them full, um, you know, because it's very difficult. And, and look, it's, it's a conversation I have all the time with people around, you know, their kids. And, you know, I, as I said, that world isn't going away. You know, no. this is always no. going to be a challenge. And, I think we have to face the challenge and just experiment and try different things and try and do the best we can. But really, for me, for my opinion, my view is the home is where I can make the big, obviously the biggest impact, and I control what comes in mostly. Um, and I, you know, beyond that though, I think they're learning experiences, and I think kids have to kind of go through a lot of these experiences to yeah. learn how it makes them feel. Yeah, I found it interesting in that, I mean, my daughters are now 19 and 17 and probably mm. increasingly healthy, although my daughter is flatting and it's her first year flatting um, in Auckland. Oh. She's a first year student. <laughs> um, and my 17-year-old, well, she's, you know, really got into long-distance running, um, um, which is mm. quite exciting. And Does so she eat low-carb or...? If yeah, you... predominantly low carb. Oh, good yeah. on her. Um, it's yeah. She, she was a girl featured. She's the yellow t-shirt one, the, the mud run. So yeah, she sort of went off running, but sort of got right back into it this year, and is now training for half marathon. She's nearly. She'll be eighteen in September, but um, you know she's noticed that she's had to have more food. But we you find that actually school holidays can be a good thing to actually trial the whole not snacking so much because you might have a little bit more time if you're in the position to be you know at home with the kids because when I was growing up I lived in a very rural area and so we'd have this breakfast and then we'd just go out for the whole morning but no one was chasing me around with a breadstick or anything like that saying you'll fall over if you don't have any snacks anything like that we'd sort of come in when we were hungry but hungry yeah but about one or two o'clock you know, but we didn't need to be snacking at 10 after having breakfast at 8. Or, yeah. Um, but we also found that even during the lockdown when the kids were at home, um, they didn't feel the need to be in and out of the kitchen all the time. Possibly we're a bit more fortunate because, you know, they're a little bit older and they, you know, had some academic goals of their own that they wanted to keep on top of. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, we didn't have a time that was characterised by multiple in and out of the kitchen. Plus, I was writing a PhD essentially at the kitchen table, so yeah, they they weren't um, they weren't in it um, in the kitchen terribly much anyway. But no, they had to leave you alone. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Um, so there's a comment. I'm studying a certificate um, for in weight management. I know I am low carb biased and hope to be able to use that to influence people's health in the future. Sister lady has been very inspired by your chat and has found it really interesting um a comment about how 
Um, I'm a recreational runner and you should see the rubbish they feed people at aid stations, especially endurance trail runs. So I asked you about your daughter, lolly, snakes, fruit cake, and potato chips. Oh dear. Yeah. Yeah. And that's that, you know, like we did the um, I don't know if you saw that I did the the hundred K Oxfam with, you know, a Dr. Yes. Avi and a few of my friends. And that was all, you know, it was all crap. You know, there was yeah. lollies and you know, you just look at what people are eating and it's such I think in the exercise space, that is a massive myth that we oh, need the carbs. And that's actually, it's really hard to overcome that because there's this mm. idea that the yeah, athletes are this sort of special bunch of people, but you look yeah, at special. the rates of chronic disease after they've stopped their, you know, elite athlete participation. And, you know, yeah. they're, they're dropping off of cancers and all yeah. sorts of things. But you still think actually, you know, Grant Schofield and Karen Zinn wrote a book about low carb for sports performances, and mm. possibly you know, they sort of did um, go into the fact that possibly if you're having a low inflammatory diet, that's going to help you recover better as well too, and that could yeah. be a problem driver. And there are some people who do, you know, Ironman competitions who do really well on a low carb diet. Um, you know, that sort of thing. It's sort of getting changing that idea that athletes need to be supplementing the whole time with carbohydrate. Mm. Um, without actually them being able to switch into using fat burning. But the problem with a lot of the sports research is that trials are expensive to do, um, but many of them don't go any longer than 12 weeks. And that's just not enough time to actually no. see any real changes. In fact, your yeah. whole body's you're just getting used to fat yeah. burning. Um, exactly. And there are going to be some um, changes in performance. Um, yeah. you know, that's right, initially. 12 weeks yeah. initially. But, mm -hmm. you know, once you're fully adapted to this, you know, and you become a much better fat burner, you actually become better at using the carbohydrate that you're taking in as well too. And that's really interesting as well it too. Is. But that hasn't filtered through to the sports nutrition. No, well. but I remember, um, you know, like uh, Peter Bruckner, I mean, he, he talks all the time about how, you know, it, it was about performance. It was never about health. But, you know, yeah. now if we've seen the consequences of that. It has to be. We can do both. We can have performance and still keep them healthy. You know, you consider the stress they're under with what they're doing and then all the stress of the food. It's like, wow, you know, big, big, but it's it's going to take a while. But I think, you know, as you say, it's a grassroots, it's a ground up. And, you know, we as people that do know have to do our best to keep sharing that message in any mm -hmm. way that we can. Um, thanks, Sarah. Great presentation. Oral health is not discussed enough. I just saw Brian Sanders of Food Lies talking about the fluoride factor. So that's interesting. I'm going to look yeah. up and see what he said. And then the food offered after you donate blood is high carb and unhealthy. It frustrates me that they don't have healthy options. And I mm. think that's all we want. We want to get to a point where, you know, we have the option of a low carb, real food, um, but we will get there. So, but it's time to end. Sarah, yeah. so I've we'll to catch you, up soon. Yes, yeah. but well, I'd love you just to finish with a, just a final wrap up um, of anything you'd like to say, Sarah. I think for ourselves individually, you know, the best way to an oral health optimized diet, which is guess what, the best way to a general health optimized diet is to, you know, enjoy meals with a whole food basis where there's plenty of protein to enable satiety through the day and to reduce the need for snacking on ultra processed foods throughout the day or any behaviors because they do have an effect on your mouth but they also have an effect on on your body systemically um, but dental caries is just a very loud ringing alarm bell um, that something may not be well metabolically and it should be recognized as such there you go that was a lot to put in one sentence wasn't it <laughs> no it was wonderful such yeah. a pleasure to have you oh, on and part of the summit always love talking to you sarah so thank you so much and um yeah send me those things and if anyone's interested i will uh, i'll put them in into the group anyway but thank you and enjoy the rest of your day okay you too it's a lovely summit to be part of and i'm looking forward to catching up on some of the talks myself awesome yeah right. they've been really good so far and some yours was awesome and great ones to come Thanks, oh, Sarah. Thank you very much. We'll see you soon. Bye. 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 All right. That was amazing.